before we get into treatment and recovery and the communities, we first have to truly understand what IPV is. Intimate partner violence, it occurs between two people in a close relationship. And the term intimate partner includes current and former spouses and dating partners. And IPV exists along a continuum. It could happen once or it can be ongoing. Men and women are abusers as well as victims. A lot of what we're going to talk about um, will focus on women because the number of cases that are reported, more than 85% of them are women. But I'm also going to talk about men as victims as well. And maybe some of the reasons why they don't report as frequently as women. The name of the game in IPV is control. An abuser wants to control their partner's thoughts, their feelings, their actions, and they want to use any and everything in order to do that. Fear, intimidation, threats, isolation, anything that they can use to control this person, they will use it. That's the basis of IPV. So now we want to look at the types of IPV. Physical, this is the one most of us are familiar with. And it's also the one that's visual. So with physical IPV, any intentional and unwanted contact with you or someone close to your body Sometimes abusive behavior does not cause pain or even leave a bruise, but it's still unhealthy. If an abuser wanted their partner to clean the house, for an example, and they didn't feel like it, and the abuser shoves them, go clean the house. It may not leave a bruise, the shove, it may not even hurt, but abuse has taken place nonetheless. Different types of physical ab abuse can include, but it's certainly not limited to, scratching, pushing, hair pulling, which I've experienced, shoving, throwing, grabbing, biting, choking, shaking, slapping, burning, use of a weapon, um, use of restraints, or they may even use their own body as a form of a restraint, holding them down, keeping them away from an exit. Those are all of the ways that someone can use their physical self or physical objects to abuse another person. Battered women average 6.9 physical assaults by the same partner in one year. So if we were to average this out, that's about approximately once every 60 days. If we did a year, about once every 60 days, they would go through Physical, we're not even talking about non-physical abuse. Every couple of months, hitting, slapping, choking, shoving, biting, burning. That's a horrible life. That's a horrible existence. And the days in between the 60 are filled with fear. One of the interviews I remember, um, we're going to call her Sarah. Sarah was a beautiful young lady. And she was a runway and print model. She still is. Her partner physically abused her, but he was very careful never to hit her in the face or the arms or anything that would be visible to the public. Because if that happened, according to her, I wouldn't make any money and he wouldn't have any money to control. So he was very savvy in where he decided to physically abuse her. Sexual. Sexual abuse refers to any action that pressures or coerces someone to do something sexually that they don't want to do. It can also refer to behavior that impacts a person's ability to control their sexual activity or the circumstances in which sexual activity occurs. This includes oral sex, rape, or restricting access 
to birth control or condoms. So some examples of sexual abuse. Unwanted is the operative word. Kissing, touching, unwanted, rough, or violent sexual activity. Rape or attempted rape. Refusing to use condoms. Restricting someone's access to birth control. Keeping someone from protecting themselves from sexually transmitted infections. Sexual contact with someone who's very drunk, drugged, unconscious, or otherwise unable to give a clear and informed yes or no. Now, with sexual abuse, it does not always have to be physical. If someone were to force their partner to watch pornographic films, to look at pornographic images, to force their partner to watch them sexually gratify themselves, that is still considered sexual abuse, even though no physical contact has taken place. Because the name of the game is control. You better do what I tell you to do. Even if it means you watch me. That is all part of sexual abuse. When sexual abuse occurs within the same household, depending on the family's culture, it may not ever end. If no one in the family speaks up and the understanding is, well, this is just how it is in our family, it may never stop. In 2010, there were 188,380 reports of rape or sexual assault in the United States. Females are more likely to be victims of rape or sexual assault than males. Most victims of rape or sexual assault are females younger than 24 years of age. This is the statistic that grabs the attention of colleges, student activities coordinators. So when I go to college campuses and I speak to their students, this is the statistic that kind of makes them go silent. Most rapes committed against women are committed by an intimate partner, spouse, boyfriend, or girlfriend, or someone else that they know. Um, a young lady I interviewed, we're calling her Maggie, she was married. Her husband um, was an alcoholic. And what she said was, she said, Erica, he would hold me down and force me to have sex for hours as a way to numb his desire for alcohol. And he would tell me, well, it's either this or I get drunk and smack you. Which one would you prefer? What kind of a choice is that? But it was a form of abuse, and she said if she didn't comply, she'd be in trouble. Emotional. Emotional abuse, threatening a partner or his or her possessions or loved ones, or harming a partner's sense of self-worth to gain and maintain control of the relationship. Emotional scars run so deep. Physical scars heal, and sometimes you can't even tell there was ever a scar there. Emotional scars are not visible, but they certainly manifest in other areas of their life. Sometimes there's just something about a person. You go, I don't understand what's up with you, but there's something. They could be living through a harsh emotional scar. Saying mean things to you doesn't allow you to make decisions, threatens you, isolates you from your friends, family, and coworkers, ignores your feelings, puts you down, calls you names, insults you, tells you that your decisions are bad, anything that's going to attack your sense of self-worth. A couple of other ones is public humiliation and malicious withdrawal of affection. So if you have a couple and one of them is experiencing a really heavy emotional traumatic experience, maybe someone close to them has passed away, and they are looking to their partner for comfort, if that partner maliciously withdraws their affection, that is part 
of emotional abuse. I know that you need me right now, but I am not going to be there for you. Sometimes emotional abuse is masked as humor or it's sarcasm. And they say, I was just playing with you. Some of the statements, these are real statements. One young lady said, my, my boyfriend used to tell me, you know, you're actually pretty cute to be so fat. Also, nobody else will ever want you. You may as well stay here. Look at you. Why would anybody want you? I'm the only one. I'm all you have. If you've heard that in your adolescence, that you're nothing, you grow up and you're with someone whom you're giving your affection and your love to and they tell you the same thing, imagine the emotional scar and how deep that's going to go. It messes with your self-worth. 48.4% of all women have experienced, and 48.8% of all men have experienced at least one psychologically aggressive behavior by an intimate partner. So 48.4% and 48.8%, that's nearly half of the population, at least once. Think about your daughters, your sisters, your aunts, your cousins. Think about your sons, your uncles. At least once, half the population. The statistics are, are staggering. Um, a young lady, um, we're gonna call her Yolanda. Yolanda said her second husband would tell her, you're a worthless bitch. He'd tell her that all the time. And whenever she'd ask him for something, you know, can I have um, money for sanitary napkins? He'd tell her, no. And she'd say, why not? he said, you know why, you tell me why. And she had to repeat, because I'm a worthless bitch. When you think about the years, day in, day out, and you have to lay next to this person on a regular basis. When we talk about emotional scarring, that scar started a long time ago. And when you enter a relationship, you're, you're usually looking for something better than what you had before. Instead, it's getting worse. The next type is verbal abuse. The use of language and tone as a means to control or subordinate another person from either self for either self-gratification or to impose one's view or will on another to gain an unfair advantage. So some of that includes a hostile tone, the volume that they use, or the intensity of delivery, such as shouting, yelling, screaming, or alternatively, sometimes they'll bring their voice down in a way to threaten or intimidate the other person. Verbal abuse can be emotionally abusive as well. For example, the abuser may use the following statements in an abusive tone to instill fear. You will be home by eight o'clock or else. How could you be so stupid? Don't you ever speak while I'm talking. The tone that they use is very intimidating. Uh, one young lady, we will call her Lisa. She said, um, I went home, I parked in the garage, and I started dinner. I forgot that my husband always likes to park his car in the garage, and there's only room for one. And it slipped her mind. So she's in the kitchen when the husband comes home and notices that his spot in the garage is not there, he flips out. He comes into the house shouting at her. At that moment, she was taking a hot casserole dish out of the oven. So when he started shouting, it startled her and she dropped it. And there's hot cheese and, and sauce and everything, it got all over her skin and her face, first degree burns. 
He never touched her. It was still a form of abuse. She was scared of him. Economic abuse. Economic abuse is very invisible. You limit a partner's access to assets or conceal information and accessibility to the family finances. And this diminishes the capacity for the partner to support him or herself. And it renders them completely dependent on the abuser. It is about control. So some of those actions include giving an allowance and monitoring what's bought after they give you the allowance, denying access to his or her own paycheck, prevention of seeing the shared bank accounts or records, using the partner's social security number to obtain credit without their permission is economic abuse, refusing to give money, food, clothing, rent, or medication, forbidding a partner to go to work, or limiting their hours. Any situation that would cause a partner to become 100% dependent on another is economic abuse. This form of abuse can be very, very subtle. Um, between 94 and 99% of domestic violence survivors have also experienced domestic, excuse me, uh, economic abuse. So I'm gonna talk about Alex and Jordan. Alex and Jordan is a lesbian couple. Alex inherited her family business. Alex, not so good with money. She readily admitted that. So when she met Jordan, who was actually very savvy with money, she was pretty relieved. She trusted her. So once Jordan learned how bad Alex was with money, she decided, you know what, I'm just going to take control of the finances. They mutually agreed. Thus far, economic abuse has not taken place. I'm bad with money. You're good with it. So let's just let you handle it. Right? But after a while, Jordan decided, you know what? I'm just going to give you an allowance. Alex said, I can, okay, I can go for that. More time passed. And then Jordan said, well, I need to know what it is that you're buying with your allowance. I need to see receipts. Alex is going, uh, okay. She said she started to get a little uncomfortable, but all right, she, she complied. She didn't think much of it. Then Jordan completely eliminated. She removed the allowance whatsoever. She said, you know what? Whenever you need something, come ask me. And I'll decipher if that's something that you need. Sometimes Alex's family would need money. Jordan wouldn't have it. Let them help themselves. Alex is like, but I work. I earn a paycheck. If it's my family and I want to help them, I should be able to help them. Alex said one day she goes to the bank and the account is no longer there. I said, what do you mean it's no longer there? Your name's on it. She said, well, um, I actually turned it over to her, like I signed, I can't remember what you call that form or whatever it was, but she said, I didn't even know how much we had in the account anymore. Every single financial aspect of our relationship was handled by her. That is economic abuse. What if Alex wanted to leave and she just got paid? Direct deposit. How is she gonna have access to her money? The next type is psychological abuse. Any act including confinement, isolation, verbal assault, humiliation, intimidation, infantilization, or any other treatment which may diminish the sense of dignity, identity, and self-worth. So basically, this is someone who plays with your mind. Some of it includes intentionally misinterpreting their traditional practices, repeating, raising the issue of death with them, making them think that there's something wrong with them, giving the impression that they're crazy, imitating or mocking the person, 
one young lady I interviewed, it was almost like it was something straight out of a movie. Like, how do you, you can't make this stuff up. She said her partner used to do things like this. One time they went in her phone and rearranged some of her appointments on her calendar. So when she get a call or an email, like, why didn't you show up or what happened? She would look and be like, I thought it was on this day or that day. And when she talked about it with her partner, her partner would go, oh, honey, that's okay. Just, we all get a little loopy sometimes. It's all right. You're stressed out. You should relax. Another instance, she said her partner used her phone while she was sleeping in the dead of night, used her phone to text himself to say, hey, um, can, can you come pick me up? And he's doing the whole conversation with both phones. Woke her up screaming, how come you didn't come and pick me up? She was like, I don't. What are you, that doesn't make sense. He was like, look, you texted me. I texted you, I said, can you come and pick me up? You said that you would. I said, how on earth did you find out that that's exactly what it is that he was doing? She said, I just started to put things together. Little comments that he would make to her throughout their relationship to say, you know what, it's okay. You're a little loopy, but we all get a little crazy. And she said, once I realized what he was doing, she said, I felt better because I knew I'm not crazy. That is psychological abuse if I've ever heard it. Um, an interesting piece of information she told me, she was in her 30s and her partner was in his 60s. She said, I thought I was safe from games. I thought I was safe from all of that immature nonsense. It knows no age no boundaries whatsoever. The next type, digital abuse. On the rise. The use of technologies, texting, social networking, social networking, bullying, harassing, stalking, or intimidating a partner by use of digital means. Dictating who you can and cannot be friends with on Facebook. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Sends negative, insulting, or threatening emails, using social media sites to keep tabs on you, um, pressure to send explicit videos or pictures, steals or insists to be given passwords, constantly text to the point of fear of being away from your phone, and or looks through your phone frequently. A face is popping into some of y'all's minds. <laughs> Right now, y'all like, wait a minute now. Huh, we, we might need to have a conversation. Mm. <laughs> hey, look at this here. So there was um, a survey conducted by the MTV and the Associated Press NORC Center for Public Affairs. So this national survey uh, was close to 1,300 teens and young adults between the ages of 14 and 24. So they wanted to gain a fresh look at digital use and abuse among young people in the United States. What they discovered is that nearly half of all young people between the ages of 14 and 24 report being electronically harassed in some form or fashion, and 40% report incidences of digital dating abuse, and 11% have shared naked pictures of themselves. So here's what it looks like. Which of the following best describes how you feel about digital abuse? This is what they're asking the teenagers and young adults. And 72% said it is a big problem in society and it does need to be addressed. They are aware that this is a problem. They agree that it needs to be addressed. And specifically with digital abuse, more and more women are the abusers more and more. Right now, statistically, males are still in the higher percentage, but it's starting to shift. 24% said it, well, you know, it's just a part of life and people shouldn't get so worked up about it. And 4% of people who took the uh, survey, they just skipped the question altogether. Uh, a young lady, we'll call her Kylie, friended someone on Facebook. She trusted the mutual friends that they had, because I asked her that. I was like, what made you accept the friend request? Because that 
That's kind of important. She said after a while, um, they decided to go out. So she went out and she said, I immediately knew, no, this, this is not somebody that I want to go out with again. But he wouldn't leave her alone. Sending Facebook messages. Hey, you know, what's going on? Can we go out again? She said, no. The messages got a little more dark. So she blocked him from Facebook. He created a new account to send her a message because you don't have to be friends on Facebook to send someone a message unless their entire account is blocked. So then she reported him to Facebook. So after Facebook came the text messages. If I can't get to you through Facebook, then I'm going to get to you through the text messages. And then he started sending her images of women being mutilated. I need you to talk to me. All you have to do is talk to me and this can stop. She said she reported him to the authorities. Um, I thought that her having, um, how can I say this? She has law enforcement officials in her family. And she said, you know, I, I thought that that would keep me kind of in a safe space. She said that did not happen. When I talked to the people in my family who were in law enforcement, they're like, you know what, just, just report it. She said, I was kind of expecting them to step in as the protectors of society and me, but she said that that did not happen and that disappointed her. Um, and this really scared her, obviously. And Kylie, I think, was only like 20, maybe 21. Someone to experience that kind of thing, that, that's spooky for any person, but for someone who's really young and they don't have a lot of life experience, that's pretty traumatizing. This next type of abuse. How many of you have ever heard of revenge porn? Okay. When I started learning about revenge porn, I did not realize how big this thing is. Really, are you kidding me? Revenge porn is the posting, sharing, or publishing of nude and or sexually explicit pictures, videos of a person on the internet without their consent, often accompanied by personal or identifying information. Talk about humiliation. But revenge porn is not new. We're talking back in the 80s. Uh, a lot of women sued Hustler magazine for publishing their photos in a section of the magazine called Beaver Hunt without their permission. Several courts determined that publishing intimate photos without verifying whether the pictured women actually gave the go ahead, gave the false impression that all of the featured women felt comfortable with their pictures appearing in a course in sex centered magazine. Revenge porn is digital sexual assault. Game-changing conviction that could shake up a controversial industry. A guilty verdict for a man who operated what's known as a revenge porn website, where people could post naked pictures of their ex-lovers. ABC's Neil Karlinski is on the story. After years of ugly headlines and nude pictures splashed across websites, women humiliated for the sheer sport of it, today in California, a new kind of revenge. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of the crime of identity theft. 28-year-old Kevin Bolard, guilty in a San Diego courtroom of six counts of extortion and 21 counts of identity theft. Tonight from jail, he says he's sorry. Yeah, here I am in the holding cell now for 24 hours, sleeping on the ground. It's not pretty miserable, so I mean, hope everybody realizes, like, I'm paying the price. The state's top prosecutor went before the news media to announce that so-called revenge porn operators are going down. I would suggest for anybody who's committing a crime with a computer, you better be clear that if you end up in a courtroom, you better bring your toothbrush because you might end up in jail. Prosecutors say Bollart posted thousands of nude and sexually explicit photos of women on his website, YouGotPosted.com, without their permission. But that was only half of it. They say he set up a second website, ChangeMyReputation.com, where they had to pay up to $350 to get the humiliating photos 
taken down. Bolart called in one report a digital sleaze maestro was immediately taken back into custody following his landmark conviction. At home, the idea was to make money, but I mean, it would obviously didn't make very good money, you know. I could have had a, a regular job and made more money off of that. Bollard faces over 20 years behind bars. The conviction is a huge victory for a growing list of victims and law enforcement who had been stuck, effectively unable to do anything about the now hundreds of sites which operate in murky legal territory. When this Danish woman found herself victimized, she too was horrified, posting this video about her experience on The Guardian. Most of those men knew those pictures were posted against my will and my humiliation was part of their thrill. I wish that I could say that the abuse ended that day or that week or that month, but years later I'm still being harassed. So she took the highly unusual step of posting her own nude photographs, photos she staged as a way, she says, for her to become comfortable with her own body again and take back control of her own identity. I get why people think that this is counterintuitive, but I disagree. Consent is key. I did this. Other victims felt trapped, like Holly Toops. Knowing that someone could, with a click of a button, take whatever information they wanted from you and share it is really troubling. It almost makes me want to shower with my clothes on. And Kayla Laws. It's embarrassing to know that they've seen that photo of me. And they know what I look like now, topless, because of that site. These revenge porn sites uh, are a bit like a, a, a hydra of evil abuse because uh, anytime one specific site gets taken down, then another one pops up in its place. California, along with their states, have now passed legislation making revenge porn sites illegal. But in most of the country, the laws are inconsistent. In general, the government's been historically terrible about keeping pace with technological innovation. In, in other words, the technology is evolving much faster than the legislation we need to regulate it. In a rare move, the FTC has now gotten into the fight. Just last week, banning another revenge porn website, isanybodydown.com, and ordering its operator to remove an estimated 1,000 nude photos, once again allegedly posted without the victim's consent. The world of revenge porn, something also known as involuntary porn, is a strange one. As we found out when we met the man many consider the godfather of revenge porn. Got my alcoholism taken care of for the rest of the week. He says he's never hacked anyone. His former website, isanyoneup.com, was designed for humiliation on a scale only the internet can offer. It's public humiliation. Yeah, it is. And you are fine with blasting it out and basically ruining, in some cases, other people. I mean, to me, I don't know these people, so, and it's kind of anonymous to me. I think uh, the people submitting it are the ones who should be, uh, you know, feeling bad when they do click that submit button. But so you have no empathy? No, they're just people, they're characters and avatars and icons on a screen. Hunter actually boasted about the woman who came to his door looking for her own brand of revenge. I was walking out of my house one day and out of nowhere, the girl we had posted, or I had posted, she stuck me in the shoulder with a big pen. And uh, this is the scar I have left. They had to surgically Whoa. remove it. Hunter Moore is no longer in the revenge porn business. He was arrested last year on hacking and identity theft charges and has pleaded not guilty. But his site, like the others, have had one more unintended shockwave. They've mobilized a small army of angry women into action. Remember Kayla Laws? Her mother Charlotte has been called the Aaron Brockovich of revenge porn. There are so many pictures there's on the internet. There's so much information out there. I don't think there's really a way to curb that. She tracked down victims like her daughter and helped spearhead California's new law. Anybody who distributes a nude or topless picture without the victim's consent, that would be illegal. Moore is now out on bond, awaiting trial later this year. If convicted, he faces up to 45 years in prison. When we last caught up with him, he still seemed to think using humiliation as a business model was a good idea. I think at some point when you get older, you might look back at the person you are now of course. And have some regret? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to grow and change as a person, but right now, and this time, uh, I'm going to take full advantage of people's mistakes and what I've created. His critics might call revenge a dish best served with a side of irony. 
Tonight, as a condition of his release, he's not even allowed to use the internet. I'm Neil Karlinski for Nightline. Are there any questions NCL. about the different types of IPV behaviors before we move forward? Remember to use your ATC model. If there's anything that we're using in here that you want to apply or teach, use that paper. All right.